From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, we bring you the General Priesthood Session of the 185th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music for this session will be provided by a priesthood choir from Brigham Young University. President Dieter F. Ubdorf, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Dear brethren, we welcome you to the General Priesthood Session of the 185th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Thomas S. Monson, who presides at the conference, has asked that I conduct this session. These services are being relayed by satellite transmission to priesthood holders in many locations throughout the world. The music for this session will be provided by a priesthood choir from Brigham Young University under the direction of Ronald Staley with Richard Elliott and Andrew Unsworth at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing for the strength of the hills. The invocation will then be offered by Brother David L. Beck, who was released this afternoon from serving as Young Men General President. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the privilege to gather in this priesthood session of General Conference. 
and to learn from thy beloved servants. We are grateful for their devotion and for their prayerful preparation. Please bless them with thy power as they share their inspired messages. May we faithfully act upon the inspiration we receive. We are grateful for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and for his atonement. May we always remember him. May our priesthood ministry be more like his, that we may bless our families and thy children everywhere. Father, we love thee. We express our gratitude to thee and offer this prayer in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The choir will now favor us with On This Day of Joy and Gladness. After the singing, we will hear from Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Ulysses Soares of the Presidency of the Seventy, who will deliver his message in his native language of Portuguese. Brother Larry M. Gibson, who was released this afternoon as first counselor in the Young Men General Presidency, will then address us.
One of the great pleasures I enjoy as I travel throughout the world is the opportunity to meet and greet our missionaries. These great elders and sisters radiate the light of Christ, and I'm always inspired by their love for the Lord Jesus Christ and their devoted service to Him. Every time I shake hands with them and feel of their remarkable spirit and faith, I say to myself, these wonderful sons and daughters of ours are truly a miracle. During the October 2002 General Priesthood meeting, I challenged bishops, parents, and prospective missionaries to raise the bar for full-time missionary service. I then said that what we need is the greatest generation of missionaries in the history of the Church. We need worthy, qualified, spiritually energized missionaries. We need your whole heart and soul. We need vibrant, thinking, passionate missionaries who know how to listen to and respond to the whisperings of the Holy Spirit. In many ways, the world today is more challenging than it was 13 years ago. Our young men and young women have many more distractions to sidetrack them in their preparations for a mission and a future happy life. Technology has expanded and almost everyone has access to handheld devices that can capture the attention of the human family of God for both great good and unconscionable ill. Tonight I speak to missionaries now serving, future missionaries, return missionaries, and all young single adult men in the Church. I pray you will understand and thoughtfully consider what I have to say to you as you journey through these exciting and extracting years of your life. In the early days of the Church, missionaries were interviewed by a general authority before they went on their mission. These days you are interviewed to serve as missionaries by your bishops and stake presidents. And most of you will go through your entire lives without being interviewed by a general authority. That is simply a reflection of the reality in a worldwide Church of more than 15 million members. I know I speak for my brethren when I tell you that we wish it was possible for us to know all of you personally and to be able to tell you that we love you and we support you. Fortunately, the Lord has provided ways for us to reach out to you. assigns every missionary to his or her mission. Through this, although this is done without traditional face-to-face -face interview, technology and revelation combine to provide experience that is remarkably intimate and personal. Let me tell you how this happens. Your photograph comes up on a computer screen together with key information provided by your bishop and stake president. When your picture appears, we look into your eyes and review your answers to the missionary recommendation questions. For that brief moment, it seems as if you are present and responding to us directly. As we look at your photograph, we trust that you have cleared in every way the raised bar required today to be a faithful, successful missionary. Then by the power of the Spirit of the Lord and under the direction of President Thomas S. Monson, we assign you to one of the Church's 406 worldwide missions. No, it isn't the same as a personal face-to-face -face interview, but it's close. Video conferencing is another way that helps us reach out to Church leaders and members who live far away from Church headquarters. With that in mind, I would like those of you preparing to serve missions, those who have returned, and all of you young adults to spend a few minutes with me 
as though we were having a personal video chat right now. Please look at me for a few minutes as though you and I were the only ones in the room wherever you are tonight. For my part, I will imagine that I'm looking into your eyes and listening carefully to your responses to a few questions that I believe will tell me a lot about the depth of your testimony and your devotion to God. If I may paraphrase what I said to missionaries 13 years ago, what we need now is the greatest generation of young adults in the history of the Church. We need your whole heart and soul. We need vibrant, thinking, passionate young adults who know how to listen and respond to the whisperings of the Holy Spirit as you make your way through the daily trials and temptations of being a young, contemporary Latter-day Saint. In other words, it's time to raise the bar not only for missionaries, but also for returned missionaries and for your entire generation. To that end, please ponder in your heart your answers to these questions. Do you search the scriptures regularly? Do you kneel in prayer to talk with your Heavenly Father each morning and each night? Do you fast and donate a fast offering each month, even if you're a poor, struggling student who can't afford to donate much? Do you think deeply about the Savior and His atoning sacrifice for you when you are asked to prepare, bless, pass, or partake of the sacrament? Do you attend your meetings and strive to keep the Sabbath day holy? Are you honest at home, school, church, and work? Are you mentally and spiritually clean? Do you avoid viewing pornography or looking at websites, magazines, movies, or apps, including Tinder and Snapchat, photos that would embarrass you if your parents, church leaders, or the Savior Himself saw you? Are you careful with your time, avoiding, avoiding inappropriate technology and social media, including video games which can dull your spiritual sensitivity? And is there anything in your life you need to change and fix beginning tonight? Thank you for this short personal visit. I hope you answered each one of these questions honestly and thoughtfully. If you find yourself lacking in any of these simple principles, then I urge you to courageously repent and bring your life back in line with gospel standards of righteous discipleship. Now, brethren, may I offer additional counsel that will help you get your testimony of the gospel deep in your hearts and your souls. I remind you, returned missionaries, that your preparation for life and for family should be continuous. R.M. doesn't mean retired Mormon. As a returned missionary, you should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of your own free will and bring to pass much righteousness. Please use the skills you learned on your mission to bless the lives of people around you every day. Do not shift your focus from serving others to focusing exclusively on school, work, or social activities. Instead, balance your life with spiritual experiences that remind and prepare you for continued daily ministering to others. During your missions, you learn the importance of visiting people in their homes. I would hope that all of our young adults, whether or not you served full-time missions, understand the importance of visiting with people who are lonely, sick, or discouraged, not only as an assignment, but because of the genuine love 
you have for Heavenly Father and His children. Those of you in high school preparing for missions, I encourage you to participate in and graduate from seminary. You young adults should enroll in an institute of religion. If you're attending a church school, consistently include a class each semester in religion, religious education. During, during this important season of preparation for a mission or eternal marriage and your life as an adult, you must continue to find ways to learn and grow and receive inspiration and guidance through the Holy Ghost. A careful, prayerful study of the gospel through seminary, institute, or religious education classes can assist you in that goal. Whether you attend the church school or not, whether you attend college or not, do not think that you're too busy to study the gospel. Seminary, institute, or religion classes will provide balance to your life and add to your secular education by giving you another opportunity to spend time studying the scriptures and the teachings of the prophets and apostles. There are four outstanding new courses that I would encourage every young adult to look into and to attend. And don't forget that classes and activities offered at your local institute or through your young single adult ward or stake will also be a place where you can be with other young men and young women and lift and inspire one another as you learn and grow spiritually and socialize together. Brethren, if you'll set aside your cell phone and actually look around a little, you may even find your future companion at the Institute. Which leads me to another bit of counsel that I'm sure you knew was coming. You young single adults need to date and marry. Please stop delaying. I know some of you fear family formation. However, if you marry the right person at the right time and the right place, you need not fear. In fact, many problems you encounter will be avoided if you are anxiously engaged in righteous dating, courting, and marriage. Don't text her. Use your own voice to introduce yourself to the righteous daughters of God that are all around you. To actually hear a human voice will shock her, perhaps into saying yes. Now, brethren, I testify to you uh, that, the, that the Lord Jesus Christ can help us fix anything that needs fixing in our lives through His atoning sacrifice. This evening, as we prepare to celebrate Easter Sunday tomorrow, please pause with me to remember the gift of Christ's atonement. Remember our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ know you best and love you the most. Through the atonement, the Redeemer took upon Himself our troubles, pains, and sins. The Savior of the world came to understand each of us individually by experiencing our dashed hopes, challenges, and tragedies through His suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross. He died as one final act of love for us and was buried in a new tomb on that fateful night. On Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead, promising new life for each of us. The risen Lord then commissioned His disciples to teach everyone to have faith in Christ, repent of sin, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and endure to the end. Brethren, we know that God our Father and His beloved Son appeared to the Prophet Joseph Smith and restored through him 
the fullness of the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Be strong, brethren. Keep the commandments of God. The Lord Jesus Christ promises all things we de desire to do in righteousness will be ours. Church leaders are counting on you. We need every one of you young adults to prepare to marry, to serve, and to lead in the days ahead, the days ahead for which I humbly pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brethren, I am humbled by the privilege I have to speak to you, the bearers of the priesthood of God, throughout the Church today. President Monson once said, quote, The world can at times be a frightening place in which to live. The moral fabric of society seems to be unraveling at an alarming speed. None, whether young or old or in between, is exempt from exposure to those things which have the potential to drag us down and destroy us. But we need not despair. We are waging a war with sin. It is a war we can and will win. Our Father in Heaven has given us the tools we need in order to do so." Close quote. All of us are faced with this war daily. The enemy and his angels are trying to distract us. Their purpose is to divert us from the covenants that we have made with the Lord, causing us to lose sight of our eternal inheritance. They know our Heavenly Father's plan for His children, for they were with us in that great council in Heaven when it was all presented. They try to take advantage of our weaknesses, deceiving us with mists of darkness, which blindeth the eyes and hardeneth the hearts of the children of men, and leadeth them away into broad roads that they perish and are lost. Despite the opposition we face, President Monson has taught that this is a war we can and will win. The Lord trusts in our capacity and determination to do so. The scriptures contain countless examples of those who have won their wars, even in the midst of very hostile situations. One of these examples is Captain Moroni in the Book of Mormon. This remarkable young man had the courage to defend the truth at a time when there were many dissensions and wars which put at risk the very survival of the Nephite nation. Though successful in exercising his responsibilities, Moroni remained humble. This and other attributes made him an extraordinary instrument in the hands of God. Alma declared, if all men had been, were, and ever would be like Moroni, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever, and the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. Moroni's attributes stemmed from his great faith in God and his son Jesus Christ and his firm determination to follow the voice of God and his prophets. Figuratively, all of us need to become modern Captain Moroni's in order to win the wars against evil. I know a very faithful de young deacon who became a modern Captain Moroni. Though he has sought to follow the counsel of his parents and church leaders, his faith and determination have been tested every day, even at his young age. He told me one day he was surprised by a very difficult and embarrassing situation. His friends were accessing pornographic images on their cell phones. In that exact moment, he had to decide what was most important, his popularity or his righteousness. Immediately filled with courage, he told his friends that what they were doing was wrong. He said they should stop doing it or they would become slaves to it. 
Most of his classmates ridiculed his counsel, saying it was a part of life and that there was nothing wrong with it. However, there was one among them who listened and decided to abandon the practice. This deacon's example had a positive influence on at least one of his classmates. Of course, he and his friends were mocked and persecuted for that decision. On the other hand, they had followed the admonition of Alma to his people when he said, Come ye out from the wicked, and be ye separate, and touch not their unclean things. The pamphlet for the strength of youth contains the following counsel from the First Presidency, quote, You are responsible for the choices you make. God is mindful of you and will help you make good choices, even if your family and friends use their agency in ways that are not right. Have the moral courage to stand firm in obeying God's will, even if you have to stand alone. As you do this, you set an example for others to follow." Close quote. The war between good and evil will continue throughout our lives, since the adversary's purpose is to make all people as miserable as he is. Satan and his angels will try to shroud and control our thoughts, tempting us to sin. If they can, they will corrupt all that is good. Nevertheless, we must understand that they only have power over us if we allow it. The scriptures also contain examples of those who so permitted the adversary and ended up being confused and destroyed, like Nehor, Korahor, and Sherem. We must be alert to this danger. We cannot allow ourselves to be confused by popular messages that are easily accepted by the world and that contradict the doctrine and true principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of these worldly messages represent nothing more than an attempt by our society to justify sin. We need to remember that in the end, all will stand before God and Jesus Christ to be judged of our works, whether they be good or evil. As we encounter these worldly messages, great courage and a solid understanding of Heavenly Father's plan will be required to choose the right. We can do it if we seek the Lord and place all our trust and faith in Him. But as the scriptures teach, we must have a sincere heart and real intent. Then the Lord, in His infinite mercy, will manifest the truth unto us by the power of the Holy Ghost, and by the power of the Holy Ghost ye may know the truth of all things. This knowledge is our testimony. It propels our faith and determination to follow the teachings of the restored gospel, regardless of the popular messages of the world. Our testimony will shield us against the fiery darts of the adversary. It will guide us safely through the darkness and confusion that exists in the world today. I learned this principle while serving as a young missionary. My companion and I were in a very small and faraway branch of the church. We tried to speak with every person in the city. They received us very well, but they liked to debate the scriptures and asked us for concrete evidence regarding the truthfulness of our teachings. I recall that each time we set out to try to prove something to people, the Spirit of God left and we felt lost and confused. We felt we should align our testimony more strongly with teaching the truths of the gospel. From that time on, when we bore testimony with all our hearts, a silent confirming power filled the room, and there was no space for confusion or argument. 
I learned that no evil forces are capable of confusing, deceiving, or subverting the power of the faith and sincere testimony of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. As the Savior Himself taught, the adversary desires to sift us as wheat, causing us to lose our ability to influence the world for good. My dear brethren, because of the wave of confusion and doubts being promoted by the world today, we must hold ever more tightly to our testimony of the resto restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Then will our ability to defend truth greatly increase. We will win the daily battles, and rather than fall on life's battlefields, we will rally others to the Master's standards. I invite all to find safety in the teachings contained in the scriptures. Captain Moroni aligned his faith in God and his testimony of the truth to the knowledge and wisdom found in the scriptures. In this way, he trusted that he would receive the blessings of the Lord and would obtain many victories, and he did. I invite all to find safety in the wise words of our current prophets. President Monson said, quote, We who have been ordained to the priesthood of God can make a difference. When we maintain our personal purity and honor our priesthood, we become righteous examples for others to follow, and we help to illuminate an increasingly dark world. Close quote. And finally, I invite all to trust in the merits and in the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Through His atoning sacrifice, we can win the wars of our time. Even in the midst of difficulties, challenges, and temptations, let us trust in His love and power to save. Christ Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I bear witness of these truths in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My father taught me a significant lesson when I was young. He sensed that I was becoming too enamored with temporal things. When I had money, I immediately spent it, almost always on myself. One afternoon, he took me to purchase some new shoes. On the second floor of the department store, he invited me to look out the window with him. What do you see? he asked. Buildings, sky, people was my response. How many? A lot. He then pulled this coin from his pocket. As he handed it to me, he asked, What is this? I immediately knew. A silver dollar. Drawing on his knowledge of chemistry, he said, If you melt that silver dollar and mix it with the right ingredients, you would have silver nitrate. If we coated this window with silver nitrate, what would you see? I had no idea. So he escorted me to a full-length mirror and asked, Now what do you see? I see me. No, he responded. What you see is silver reflecting you. If you focus on the silver, all you will see is yourself. And like a veil, it will keep you from seeing clearly the eternal destiny Heavenly Father has prepared just for you. Larry, he continued, seek not the things of this world. But seek first the kingdom of God and to establish His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He told me to keep the dollar and never lose it. Each time I looked at it, I was to think about the eternal destiny that Heavenly Father has for me. I loved my father and how he taught. I wanted to be like him. 
He planted in my heart the desire to be a good father, and my deepest hope is that I am living up to his example. Our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, has often said that our decisions determine our destiny and have eternal consequences. Should we not then develop a clear vision of our eternal destiny, particularly the one that Heavenly Father wants us to achieve, eternal fatherhood? Let our eternal destiny drive all of our decisions. Regardless of how difficult those decisions may be, Father will sustain us. I learned about the power of such a vision when I joined my 12- and 13-year-old sons for a 50-20 competition. A 50-20 consists of walking 50 miles in less than 20 hours. We started at 9 p.m. and walked all night and most of the next day. It was an excruciating 19 hours, but we succeeded. Upon returning home, we literally crawled into the house where a wonderful wife had prepared a lovely dinner, which we didn't touch. My younger son collapsed totally exhausted on the couch while my older son crawled downstairs to his bedroom. After some painful rest of my own, I went to my younger son to make sure he was still alive. Are you okay, I asked. Dad, that was the hardest thing I have ever done, and I never want to do it again. I wasn't about to tell him that I would never do it again either. Instead, I told him how proud I was that he had accomplished such a hard thing. I knew it would prepare him for other hard things he would face in his future. With that thought, I said, Son, let me make you this promise. When you go on your mission, you will never have to walk 50 miles in one day. Good, Dad, then I'm going. <laughs> Those simple words filled my soul with gratitude and joy. I then went downstairs to my oldest son. I lay by him, then touched him. Son, are you all right? Dad, that was the most difficult thing I have ever done in my life, and I will never, ever do it again. His eyes closed, then opened, and he said, Unless my son wants me to. Tears came as I expressed how grateful I was for him. I told him I knew he was going to be a much better father than I was. My heart was full because at this young and tender age, he already recognized that one of his most sacred priesthood duties was to be a father. He had no fear of the role and title, the very title that God himself wants us to use when we speak to him. I knew I had a responsibility to nurture the embers of fatherhood that were burning within my son. These words of the Savior took on a much deeper meaning to me as a father. Quote, The son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the father do. For whatsoever things he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. I do nothing of myself but as my father hath taught me. Close quote. I love being a husband and father, married to a chosen daughter of heavenly parents. I love her. It is one of the most fulfilling parts of my life. My hope that night was that my five sons and their sister would always see in me the joy that comes from eternal marriage, fatherhood, and family. Fathers, I am sure you have heard the saying, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Every day you are teaching your children what it means to be a father. You are laying a foundation for the next generation. Your sons will learn how to be husbands and fathers by observing the way you fulfill these roles. For example, do they know how much you love and cherish their mother and how much you love being their father? They will learn how to treat their future wife and children as they watch you treat each one of them just as Heavenly Father would. Through your example, they can learn how to respect, honor, and protect womanhood. In your home, they can learn to preside over their family in love and righteousness. They can learn to provide the necessities of life and protection for their family, temporally and spiritually. Brethren, 
With all the energy of my soul, I ask you to consider this question. Do your sons see you striving to do what Heavenly Father would have them do? I pray the answer is yes. If the answer is no, it's not too late to change, but you must begin today, and I testify that Heavenly Father will help you. Now, you young men that I dearly love, you know you are preparing to receive the Melchizedek Priesthood, receive sacred temple ordinances, fulfill your duty and obligation to serve a full-time mission, and then, without waiting too long, get married in the temple to a daughter of God and have a family. You are then to lead your family in spiritual things as guided by the Holy Ghost. I have asked many young men around the world, why are you here? So far, not one has responded to learn to be a father, that I might be prepared and qualified to receive all that Heavenly Father has. Let's examine your Aaronic priesthood duties as described in Section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Be sensitive to what you feel as I apply these duties to your service in your family. Invite all of your family to come unto Christ. Watch over them always and be with and strengthen them. Preach, teach, expound, exhort, and baptize members of your family. Exhort them to pray vocally and in secret and attend to all family duties. See that there is no iniquity in your family, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, nor evil speaking. See that your family meets together often. Assist your father in his duties as patriarch. Support your mother with priesthood strength when a father is not present. When asked, ordain other priests, teachers, and deacons in your family. Doesn't this sound like the work and role of a father? Fulfilling your ironic priesthood duties is preparing you young men for fatherhood. The Duty to God resource can help you learn about and make specific plans to fulfill your duties. It can serve as a guide and assistance as you seek Heavenly Father's will and set goals to accomplish it. Father in Heaven has brought you here at this particular time for a special work and eternal purpose. He wants you to see clearly and understand what that purpose is. He is your Father, and you can always turn to Him for guidance. I know that Heavenly Father is concerned about each of us individually and has a personal plan for each to achieve our eternal destiny. He has sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to help us overcome our imperfections through the Atonement. He has blessed us with the Holy Ghost to be a witness companion, and guide to our eternal destination if we will rely on Him. May we each enjoy the fullness of Father's blessings in this life and the fulfillment of His work and His glory by becoming fathers to our families for eternity. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. On a signal from the conductor, the choir and congregation will join in singing Hark All Ye Nations. It will then be my privilege to address you. Following my remarks, we will be pleased to hear from President Henry B. Eyring, First Counselor in the First Presidency.
In the late 18th century, <coughs> Catherine the Great of Russia announced she would tour the southern part of her empire, accompanied by several foreign ambassadors. The governor of the area, Gregory Potemkin, desperately wanted to impress these visitors. And so he went to a remarkable length to showcase the country's accomplishments. For part of the journey, Catherine floated down the Dnieper River, proudly pointing out to the ambassadors the thriving hamlets along the shore filled with industrious and happy townspeople. There was only one problem. It was all for show. It is said that Potemkin had assembled pasteboard facades of shops and homes. He had even positioned busy-looking peasants to create the impression of a prosperous economy. Once the party disappeared around the bend of the river, Potemkin's men packed up the fake village and rushed it downstream in preparation for Catherine's next pass. Although modern historians have questioned the truthfulness of this story, the term Potemkin village has entered the world's vocabulary. It now refers to any attempt to make others believe we are better than we really are. It is part of human nature to want to look our best. It is why many of us work so hard on the exterior of our homes and why our young Iranic priesthood brethren make sure every hair is in place just in case they run into that special someone. There's nothing wrong with shining our shoes, smelling our best, or even hiding the dirty dishes before the home teachers come. <laughs> However, when taken to extremes, this desire to impress can shift from useful to deceitful. The Lord's prophets have ever raised a warning voice against those who draw near to the Lord with their mouth and with their lips to honor him, but have removed their heart far from him. The Savior was understanding and compassionate with sinners whose hearts were humble and sincere. But he rose up in righteous anger against hypocrites, like the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, those who tried to appear righteous in order to win the praise, influence, and wealth of the world, all the while oppressing the people they should have been blessing. The Savior compared them to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. In our day, the Lord has similarly strong words for priesthood holders who try to cover their sins or to gratify their pride or their vain ambition. When they do this, he said, the heavens withdraw themselves, the Spirit of the Lord is grieved, and when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood or the authority of that man. Why does this happen? Why do we sometimes try to appear active, prosperous, and dedicated outwardly when on the inside, as a revelator said on the, of the Ephesians, we have left our first love. In some cases, we may simply have lost our focus on the essence of the gospel. Mistaking the form of godliness for the power thereof. This is especially dangerous when we direct our outward expressions of discipleship to impress others for personal gain or influence. It is then when we are at risk of entering into Pharisee territory. And it is high time to examine our hearts to make an immediate course correction. 
This temptation to appear better than we are is found not just in our personal lives, but can be found in our church assignments as well. For example, I know of a stake where the leaders set some ambitious goals for the year. While the goals all looked worthwhile, they focused either on lofty, impressive declarations or on numbers and percentages. After these goals had been discussed and agreed upon, something began to trouble the stake president. He thought about the members of his stake, like the young mother with small children who was recently, recently widowed. He thought about members who were struggling with doubts or loneliness or with severe health conditions and no insurance. He thought about the members who were grappling with broken marriages, addictions, unemployment, and mental illness. And the more he thought about them, the more he asked himself a humbling question. Will our new goals make a difference in the lives of those members? He began to wonder how their stakes goals might have been different if they had first asked, what is our ministry? So this stake president went back to his councils and together they shifted their focus. They determined that they would not allow the hungry, the needy, the naked, the sick, and the afflicted to pass by them and notice them not. They set new goals, recognizing that success with these new goals could not always be measured, at least not by man. For how does one measure personal testimony, love of God, or compassion for others. But they also knew that many of the things you can count do not count. And many of the things you cannot count really do count. I wonder if our organizational and personal goals are sometimes the modern equivalent of a Potemkin village. Do they look impressive from the distance but fail to address the real needs of our beloved fellow man? My dear friends and fellow priesthood holders, if Jesus Christ were to sit down with us and ask for an accounting of our stewardship, I'm not sure he would focus much on programs and statistics. What the Savior would want to know is the condition of our heart. He would want to know how we love and minister to those in our care, how we show our love to our spouse and family, and how we lighten their daily load. And the Savior would want to know how and how you and I grow closer to him and to our Heavenly Father. It may be beneficial to search our own hearts. For example, we might ask ourselves, why do we serve in the Church of Jesus Christ? We could even ask, why are we here at this meeting today? I suppose if I were to answer that question a, on a superficial level, I could say that I'm here because President Monson assigned me to speak. So I really didn't have a choice. <laughs> Besides that, my wife, whom I love very much, expects me to attend. And how can I say no to her? But we all know there are better reasons for attending our meetings and living our lives as committed disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm here because I desire with all my heart to follow my master, 
Jesus Christ. I yearn to do all that he asks of me in this great cause. I hunger to be edified by the Holy Spirit and hear the voice of God as he speaks through his ordained servants. I'm here to become a better man, to be lifted by the inspiring examples of my brothers and sisters in Christ, and to learn how to more effectively minister to those in need. In short, I'm here because I love my Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm sure this is your reason too. This is why we are willing to make sacrifices and not just declarations to follow the Savior. This is why we bear with honor His holy priesthood. Whether your testimony is thriving and healthy or your activity in the Church more closely resembles a Potemkin village, the good news is that you can, can build on whatever strength you have. Here in the Church of Jesus Christ, you can mature spiritually and draw closer to the Savior by applying gospel principles day by day. With patience and persistence, even the smallest act of discipleship or the tiniest ember of belief can become a blazing bonfire of a consecrated life. In fact, that's how most bonfires begin, as a simple spark. So, if you feel small and weak, please simply come unto Christ, who makes weak things strong. The weakest among us, through God's grace, can become spiritually strong because God is no respecter of persons. He is our faithful God, with, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments. It is my conviction that if God can reach out and sustain a poor German refugee from a modest family in a war-torn country half a world away from the headquarters of the Church, then he can reach out to you. My beloved brothers in Christ, the God of creation who breathed life into the universe surely has the power to breathe life into you. Surely he can make of you the genuine spiritual being of light and truth you desire to be. God's promises are sure and certain. We can be forgiven of our sins and cleansed from all unrighteousness. And if we continue to embrace and live true principles in our personal circumstances and in our families, we will ultimately arrive at a point where we hunger no more, neither thirst any more. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed us and shall lead us unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. But this cannot happen if we hide behind personal dogmatic or organizational facades. Such artificial discipleship not only keeps us from seeing ourselves as who we really are, but it also prevents us from truly changing through the miracle of the Savior's atonement. The Church is not an automobile showroom, a place to put ourselves on display so that others can admire our spirituality capacity or prosperity. It is more like a service center where vehicles in need of repair come for maintenance and rehabilitation. And are we not, all of us, in need of repair, of maintenance and rehabilitation? We come to church not to hide our problems, 
but to heal them. And as priesthood holders, we have an additional responsibility to feed the flock of God, not by constraint, but willingly, not for personal gain, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Remember, brethren, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. The greatest, most capable, most accomplished man who ever walked this earth was also the most humble. He performed some of his most impressive service in private moments with only a few observers whom he asked to tell no man what he had done. When someone called him good, he quickly deflected the compliment, insisted that only God is truly good. Clearly, the praise of the world meant nothing to him. His single purpose was to serve his Father and do always those things that please him. We would do well to follow the example of our Master. My dear brethren, this is our high and holy calling, to be agents of Jesus Christ, to love as he loved, to serve as he served, to lift up the hands which hang down and strengthen the feeble knees, and to look after the poor and the needy, and to care for the widows and the orphans. I pray, brethren, that as we serve in our families, quorums, wards, stakes, communities, and nations, we will resist the temptation to draw attention to ourselves and instead strive for far greater honor to become humble, genuine disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we do so, we will find ourselves walking the path that leads to our best, most genuine and noblest selves. Of this I testify in the name of our Master, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am grateful for the trust to speak to the priesthood of God in all the earth. I feel the weight of that opportunity because I know something of the trust that the Lord has placed in you. With your acceptance of the priesthood, you have received the right to speak and to act in the name of God. That right will only become a reality as you receive inspiration from God, only then will you be able to speak in his name, and only then can you act in his name. You might have made the mistake of thinking, oh, that isn't so difficult. I could get inspiration if I'm ever asked to give a talk, or if I ever need to give a priesthood blessing. Or the young teacher or deacon might have taken comfort in the thought, well, when I'm older, or when I'm called as a missionary, then I will know what God would say and what God would do. But think of the day when you must know what God would say and what He would do. It has already come for us all, wherever you are in your calling in the priesthood. I grew up in the mission fields in the eastern United States during World War II. The members lived far apart, and there was strict gas rationing. I was the only deacon in the branch. The members gave their fast offering envelopes to the branch president when they came to fast and testimony meeting in our home, which was the chapel. At the age of 13, we moved to Utah to live in a large ward. I remember my first assignment to walk to homes 
to collect fast offerings. I looked at the name on one of the envelopes I was given and noticed the last name was the same as one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon. So I knocked on the door with confidence. The man opened the door, looked at me, scowled, and then barked at me to go away. I went away with my head down. That was nearly 70 years ago, but I still remember the feeling I had that day on the doorstep that there was something I was supposed to have said or done. If only I had prayed in faith as I went out that day, I might have been inspired to stay a moment longer on the doorstep, smile and say something like, it's good to meet you. Thank you for what you and your family have given in the past. I look forward to seeing you next month. <laughs> had I said and done that, he might have been even more irritated and even offended. But I know now how I might have felt. Rather than a feeling of sadness or failure as I walked away, I might have felt the soft commendation in my mind and heart, well done. All of us must speak and act in the name of God in moments where our unaided judgment will not be enough without inspiration. Those moments can come upon us where there is not time to make preparation. That has happened to me often. It did many years ago in a hospital where a father told me and my companion that the doctors had told him that his critically injured three-year-old daughter would die within minutes. As I placed my hands on the one spot on her head not covered with bandages, I had to know, as God's servant, what he would do and say. The words came to my mind and my lips that she would live. The doctor standing by me snorted in disgust and asked me to get out of the way. I walked out of that hospital room with a feeling of peace and love. The little girl lived and walked down the aisle into a sacrament meeting on my last day in that city. I still remember the joy and satisfaction I felt from what I had said and done in the Lord's service for that little girl and her family. The difference in my feelings at the hospital and the sadness I felt as I walked away from that door as a deacon came from what I had learned about the connection of prayer to priesthood power. As a deacon, I had not yet learned that the power to speak and act in God's name requires revelation and to have it when we need it requires praying and working in faith for the companionship of the Holy Ghost. On the evening before I went to that door for fast offerings, I think I had said my prayers at bedtime. But for weeks and months before that phone call came from the hospital, I had followed a pattern of prayer and made the effort that President Joseph F. Smith taught will allow God to give us the inspiration necessary for, for us to have power in the priesthood. He put it simply, quote, we do not have to cry unto him with many words. We do not have to weary him with long prayers. What we do need and what we should do as Latter-day Saints for our own good and to, is to go before him often to witness unto him that we remember him and that we are willing to take upon us his name, keep his commandments and work righteousness. And then President Smith told us that we should pray for what we should pray for as servants, pledged to act and speak for God. He said, quote, what do you pray for? You pray that God may recognize you, that he may hear your prayers. It is not a matter so much of which words to use, but it will take some patience. It is an approach to your heavenly Father with the intent to be recognized by him personally. Close quote. He is the God above all 
the father of all, and yet, yet willing to give undivided attention to one of his children. That may be why the Savior used the words, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Close quote. It is easier to get the proper feeling of reverence when you are kneeling or bowing your head, but it is possible to feel that you are approaching your Heavenly Father in less formal and even in silent prayer, as you will often need to do in your priesthood service. There will be noise and people around you most of your waking day. God hears your silent prayers, but you have to learn to shut out the distractions because the moment you need the connection with God may not come in quiet times. President Smith suggested that you will need to pray that God will recognize your call to serve Him. He already knows about your call in complete detail. He called you. And by praying to Him about your call, He will reveal more for you to know. I will give you an example of what a home teacher might do as he prays. You might, may already know that you are too, as you've just heard, visit the house of each member, exhorting them to pray vocally and in secret, and attend to all family duties, to watch over the church always, and be with and strengthen them, and see that there is no iniquity in the church, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, nor evil speaking, and see that the church meet together often, and also see that all the members do their duty, close quote. Now, even for the experienced home teacher and his junior companion, that is clearly impossible without the help of the Holy Ghost. Think of the families or even individuals you've been called to save, to serve. Human judgment and good intentions will not be enough. So you will pray for the way to know their hearts, to know what things are amiss in the lives and hearts of people you don't know well and are not anxious to have you know. You will need to know what God would have you do to help them and to do it all as nearly as you can, feeling God's love for them. It is because you have such important and difficult priesthood calls that President Smith suggests that when you pray, you always plead with God that He will bless you with His Spirit. You will need the Holy Ghost, not once, but as much as God will grant it to you for your constant companion. That is why we always pray that God will guide us in our service to His children. Because we cannot rise to our priesthood potential without the Spirit going with us, you are a personal target for the enemy of all happiness. If He can tempt you to sin, He can lessen your power to be led by the Spirit and so reduce your power in the priesthood. That is why President Smith said that you should always pray that God will warn and protect you from evil. He warns us in many ways. Warnings are part of the plan of salvation. Prophets, apostles, stake presidents, bishops, and missionaries all raise the warning voice to escape calamity and to escape through faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, and making and keeping sacred covenants. As a priesthood holder, you are to be part of the warning voice of the Lord. But you need to heed the warning yourself. You will not survive spiritually without the protection of the companionship of the Holy Ghost in your daily life. You must pray for it and work to have it. Only with that guide will you be able to find your way along the straight and narrow path through the mists of evil. The Holy Ghost will be your guide as He reveals truth when you study the words of prophets. Getting that guidance will take more than casual listening and reading. You will need to pray and work in faith to put the words of truth down into your heart. You must pray that God will bless you with His Spirit, that He will lead you into all truth and show you the right way. That is how He will warn and guide you into the right path in your life and in your priesthood service. General Conference provides a great opportunity to let the Lord strengthen your power to serve in the priesthood of God. 
You can prepare yourself, as I'm sure you have for this conference, with prayer. You can join your faith with those who will pray in the conference. They will pray for many blessings on many people. They will pray for the Spirit to come upon the prophet as the Lord's mouthpiece. They will pray for the apostles and all of the servants called by God. That includes you, from the newest deacon to the seasoned high priest. And some, both old and young, may soon go to the world, the spirit world, where they will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That salutation will go to some who will be surprised by it. They may never have held high office in the kingdom of God on the earth. Some may have felt that they saw little result from their labors or that some opportunities to serve were never given to them. Others may feel that their time of service was cut shorter in the, this life than they had hoped. It will not be the offices held or the time serviced that will serve that will be weighed in the balance with the Lord. We know this from the Lord's parable of the laborers in the vineyard, where the pay was the same regardless of how long they served or where. They will be rewarded for how they served. I know a man, a dear friend, whose mortal service in the vineyard ended last night at 11 o'clock. He had been treated for cancer for years. During those years of treatment and terrible pain and difficulty, he accepted a call to hold meetings with and be responsible for members in his ward whose children were gone from their homes. Some were widows. His calling was to find and help them receive comfort in sociology and sociality and gospel learning. When he got the final sobering prognosis that he only a short time to live, his bishop was away for a business trip. Two days later, he sent a message to his bishop through his high priest group leader. He said this about his assignment, quote, I understand the bishop is out of town, so I'm in action. I'm thinking of a meeting for our group next Monday. Two members can take us for a tour of the conference center. We could use some members to drive them and some scouts to push wheelchairs. Depending upon who signs up, we may have enough oldsters to do it ourselves, but it would be good to know if we had backup if needed. It could also be a good family night for the helpers to bring their families as well. Anyway, let me know before I post the plan. Thanks. And then he surprised the bishop with a phone call. Without a reference to his own condition or his valiant efforts in his assignment, he asked, Bishop, is there anything I could do for you? Only the Holy Ghost could have allowed him to feel the bishop slowed when his own load was so crushing, and only the Spirit could have made it possible for him to create a plan to serve his brothers and sisters with the same precision he used in planning scouting offense events when he was a scoutmaster years before. With a prayer of faith, can, God can grant us power in the priesthood for whatever circumstance we may be in. It simply requires that we ask in humility for the Spirit to show us what God would have us say and do, do it, and continue to live worthy of that gift. I bear you my testimony that God the Father lives, loves us, and hears our every prayer. I bear testimony that Jesus is the living Christ whose atonement makes it possible for us to be purified and so be worthy of the companionship of the Holy Ghost, I testify that with our faith and diligence, we can one day hear the words that will bring us joy. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I pray that we will receive that wonderful benediction from the Master we serve. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brethren, 
We are grateful for your attendance this evening. We likewise thank the priesthood choir for the inspiring music they have provided and acknowledge all those who have assisted in preparing for these proceedings in any way. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Master, the Tempest is Raging. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Robert C. Gay of the Seventy. President Monson. One of my most vivid memories is attending priesthood meeting as a newly ordained deacon and singing the opening hymn, Come all ye sons of God who have received the priesthood. Tonight, to all assembled here in the conference center and indeed throughout the world, I echo the spirit of that special hymn and say to you, Come all ye sons of God who have received the priesthood. Let us consider our callings. Let us reflect on our responsibilities. Let us determine our duty. And let us follow Jesus Christ, our Lord. We may differ in age, in customs, or in nationality. We're united as one in our priesthood callings to teach to each of us the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood to Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith by John the Baptist is most significant. Likewise, the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood to Joseph and Oliver by Peter, James, and John is a cherished event. Let us take most seriously the callings, the responsibilities, and the duties which come with the priesthood we hold. I felt a great responsibility when I was called to be the secretary of my deacon's quorum. I prepared most conscientiously the records I kept, but I wanted to do the very best I knew how to do in that calling. I took great pride in my work. Doing all I can to the very best of my ability has been my goal in any position I have ever held. I hope each young man who has been ordained to the Aaronic priesthood is given a spiritual awareness of the sacredness of his ordained calling, as well as opportunities to magnify that calling. I received such an opportunity as a deacon when the bishopric asked that I take the sacrament to a shut-in who lived about a mile from our chapel. That special Sunday morning, as I knocked on Brother Wright's door and heard his feeble voice call, Come in. I enter not only his humble cottage, but also a room filled with the Spirit of the Lord. I approached Brother Wright's bedside and carefully placed a piece of the bread to his lips. I then held a cup of water that he might drink. As I departed, I saw tears in his eye. And he said, God bless you, my boy. And God did bless me with an appreciation for the sacred emblems of the sacrament and for the priesthood which I held. No deacon, teacher, or priest from our ward will ever forget the memorable visits we made to Clarkston, Utah, to the graveside of Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. As we surrounded the tall granite shaft which marks his grave, and as one of the quorum leaders read to us those penetrating words from the testimony of three witnesses found at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, we developed a love for that sacred record and were the truths found therein. During those years, our objective was to become as the sons of Messiah. Of them it was said, and I quote, they had waxed strong in the knowledge of the truth, for they were men of a sound understanding 
and they had searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. But this is not all. They'd given themselves too much prayer and fasting. Therefore, they had the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. And when they taught, they taught with power and authority of God." Close quote. I cannot think of a more worthy goal for a young man to have than to be described as were the valiant and righteous sons of Messiah. As I approached my 18th birthday, prepared to enter the mandatory military service required of young men during World War II, I was recommended to receive the Melchizedek priesthood. But first, I needed to telephone my stake president, Paul C. Child, for an interview. He was one who loved and understood the Holy Scriptures, and it was his intent that all others should similarly love and understand them. Having heard from some of my friends of his rather detailed and searching interviews, I deserve minimum exposure on my scriptural knowledge. Therefore, when I called him, I suggested we meet the following Sunday at a time I knew was just an hour before his sacrament meeting. His response, oh, Brother Monson, that would not provide us sufficient time to peruse the scriptures. He then suggested a time three hours before his sacrament meeting. And he instructed me to take with me my personally marked and referenced set of scriptures. When I arrived at his home on Sunday, I was greeted warmly. And then the interview began. <laughs> President Child said, Brother Monson, you hold the ironic priesthood. Have you ever had angels minister to you? I replied that I had not. When he asked if I knew I was entitled to such, I again replied that I had not known. He instructed, Brother Monson, repeat from memory the 13th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, quote, quote. <laughs> I began, upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of the Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels. Quote. Stop, President Child directed. Then in a calm, kindly tone, he counseled. Brother Monson, never forget that as the holder of the Aaronic priesthood, you are entitled to the ministering of angels. It was almost as though an angel were in the room that day. I've never forgotten the interview. I yet feel the spirit of that solemn occasion as we together read of the responsibilities, the duties, and the blessings of the erotic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. Blessings which come not only to us, but also to our families and to others. We will have the privilege to serve. I was ordained an elder, and on the day of my departure for active duty with the Navy, a member of my ward bishopric joined my family and friends at the train station to bid me farewell. Just before train time, he placed in my hand a small volume titled Missionary Handbook. I laughed and commented that I wasn't going on a mission. He answered, take it anyway. It may come in handy. It did. I needed a hard rectangular object to place in the bottom of my sea bag so that my clothing would stay more firm, would thus be less wrinkled. The missionary handbook was just what I needed. And it served well in my sea bag for 12 weeks. The night before our Christmas leave, our thoughts were of home. The barracks were quiet. Then the silence was broken by my buddy at the adjoining bunk, a Mormon boy, 
Leland Merrill, who began to moan in pain. I inquired concerning the reason. He said he felt really sick. He did want, not want to go to the base dispensary, for that he knew that doing such would prevent his going home the following day. He seemed to grow worse as the hours passed. Finally, knowing that I was an elder, he asked me to give him a priesthood blessing. Hmm. I'd never before given a priesthood blessing. I'd never received a blessing. I'd never witnessed a blessing being given. As I prayed silently for help, I remembered the missionary handbook in the bottom of my sea bag. I quickly emptied the bag and took the book to the night light. There I read how one blesses the sick. With many curious sailors looking on, I proceeded with the blessing. Before I could put everything back into my bag, Leland Merrill was sleeping like a child. He awakened the following morning, feeling fine. The gratitude each of us felt for the power of the priesthood was immense. The years have brought me more opportunities to provide blessings to those in need than I could possibly count. Each opportunity has found me deeply grateful that God had entrusted to me this sacred gift. I revere the priesthood. I witnessed its power time and time again. I've seen its strength. I've marveled at the miracles it has wrought. Brethren, each of us has been entrusted with one of the most precious gifts ever bestowed upon mankind. As we honor our priesthood and live our lives so that we are at all times worthy, the blessings of the priesthood will follow through us. I love the words found in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 121, verse 45, which tell us what we must do to be worthy, and I quote, let thy vows be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith, and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God, and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven." Close quote. As bearers of the priesthood of God, we're engaged in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have answered his call. We are on his errand. Let us learn of him. Let us follow in his footsteps. Let us live by his precepts. By so doing, we will be prepared for any service he calls us to perform. This is his work. This is his church. Indeed, he is our captain, the king of glory, even the son of God. I testify that he lives and bear this witness in his holy name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our beloved Father in heaven, at the close of this meeting of the priesthood of God in all the earth, we thank thee for the privilege to be a priesthood holder. We thank thee for the messages, spoken and unspoken, that we have received through the warning and guiding voice of the Holy Ghost spoken by thy servants this evening. We love our prophet Thomas S. Monson. We love our first presidency. And we pray thy blessings upon them in every needful way as they direct the affairs of this priesthood and this church. As counsel tonight, Father, we pray for the Holy Ghost to help us to examine our hearts and to examine our ministry. We pray to be empowered by thy same spirit to improve in our high and holy calling, to bless thy flock, our families, and to serve the world. We also pray a special blessing upon the rising generation of the single adults that they may hear the charge to raise the bar. And as we go home this evening, we now pray for safety. And we offer our thanks, truly, for the Savior of this world and for his atonement, 
whose triumph we celebrate tomorrow. And we say and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.